Hello, hello, everybody. I think we'll get started. Um, welcome to the Haynes Walton Jr. Lecture, which honors uh, Haynes' legacy and his many contributions to research, to his students, and to his Department of Political Science here, and to our own Center for Political Studies. Uh, this event is also part of the Institute for Social Research's series of events for MLK Jr. and part of ISR's Inclusive Research Matters series. Uh, I am Ken Coleman, uh, Director of the Center for Political Studies here at ISR. It's a great honor for all of us here at CPS to host this event and to have Christian as our speaker today. I welcome you on behalf of the entire Center for Political Studies staff and faculty. To those of us here who knew him or know his work and especially worked with him or were mentored by him, you know, as I do, that Haynes was a very special person. Uh, I knew Haynes from the first day I came to the university, and I feel very fortunate for that. Uh, he was an acute observer of human behavior and it showed in his demeanor and in his research. And as if you knew him, he laughed easily and was always friendly. As a scholar, he was guided by the search for deeper truths about American society. For those who didn't know Haynes personally, you see his legacy around you in the university in the strength of our programming and faculty and students in the study of race, ethnicity, and politics. He was instrumental in making our center and the Department of Political Science a top place to study the important issues in this area of research. Now I need to do an absolutely shameless plug. We are making a very concerted effort to build the Haynes Walton Jr. Endowment for Graduate Study of racial and ethnic politics. And that fund is increasing thanks to donors, some of whom are in this room, but we need to continue to fundraise to achieve milestones so that we can assure support for students into perpetuity. I encourage you to think about a gift to the fund that will benefit graduate students directly. We're all grateful to Haynes when he was a part of our center, and we're grateful now, and we're grateful for all those who support his legacy, including those who've already contributed to that fund and those of you here today. I'm now gonna turn the lectern over to Vince Hutchins, who's gonna introduce our speaker. Hello, everyone, thank you. I've got some prepared remarks here, so I'll go through them. Um, I know we're all here to hear the speaker, so I'll keep this brief. There's a lot that could be said about the scholarly achievements of my colleague Christian Davenport, but in an effort to keep this brief, I'll just touch on some of the uh, important highlights. I think Christian would describe himself primarily as a conflict scholar, but his expertise is actually remarkably broad and incorporates, and by this I mean he has published uh, within the various subfields I'm about to mention, in comparative politics, uh, international relations or world politics, and in American politics. Indeed, he's even taught in political theory. A few years ago, he co-taught a course uh, on black political thought. So he's a, a broad intellect in a lot of respects, some of which will be on display uh, this afternoon, I'm sure. Christian has authored six books along with approximately 50 <coughs> journal articles and book chapters. He has published his work in all of the top outlets, uh, general journals in the profession, as well as top subfield journals. He's generated, from what I could uh, discern by going over his CV, roughly two dozen uh, um, uh, foundation grants or grants from uh, NSF and other um, sources. He has received numerous domestic and international awards, including being elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2018. And just to conclude here now on a more personal note, um, I wanna indicate the following. Um, Christian and I have known each other for many years and our paths have crossed 
many times before he came to work here at the University of Michigan. Uh, I think we're exactly the same age, too, by the way, although he wears it a lot better than I do. Um, and in part, our relationship, uh, our initial friendship uh, emerged because of our mutual friendship with Darren Davis. But we really got to know each other when he joined the faculty here in the fall of 2012. We quickly became fast friends. And um, even when we didn't always agree with one another we still managed to maintain a strong friendship. Uh, I'll just tell a quick anecdote here and conclude. I remember that shortly after Christian joined the faculty in the fall of 2012, he and I, along with Haynes Walton, went out for one of uh, the celebrated lunches that Haynes liked to sponsor. And Haynes, of course, characteristically uh, picked up the tab for that lunch. And I remember we had a great time laughing and discussing all the all the projects we hope to pursue collectively, all the things we hope to accomplish as a collective now that Christian had joined the faculty. Unfortunately, as, as many of you know, uh, Haynes passed away shortly thereafter in, the, in January of 2013. So those plans never came to fruition. Still, I know how happy Haynes would be to have Christian giving this presentation in his honor. And, um, I'm very happy to do so as well. So without further ado, Christian Davenport. I'm thinking of, um, Haynes would not have been comfortable with that. But <laughs> um, he was not one for, um, he was not one for praise or too much attention, and he was very kind of matter-of-fact and, and humble. Um, being from Manhattan, I don't share all of that with him, but, um, <laughs> but I do have uh, certain elements of that, which I think, um, I think are, are very prominent. I do remember that lunch incredibly well. Anybody that goes to a new institution, you know, you know what that initial embrace or lack thereof feels like. Um, you know what sitting in the, the hallway and not knowing anybody feels like. You know what, it was like junior high school or high school, right? You remember sitting in the, like, damn, who are these people? Who, how do they all know each other? Or going to, like, the Midwest political science meeting, sitting in, the, sitting in the hotel lobby and just watching everybody seem to know everybody. And then you show up. And I remember sitting in my office. I was just taking stuff out of a box, and then Haynes showed up. And I meant to, I, I meant to wear a hat. I also thought I was going to use your hat for a second because he always, he always wore a baseball cap. And so... He like walked in and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, Professor Walton. He was like, so Christian, how you doing? And he sat down and helped me unpack for a little bit. We just kind of chatted. And he was just like, hey, let's let's get some coffee. And I just remember that the warmth of that particular moment, because you're just like, okay, well, all right, I'm I'm in the spot. Cause as um Vince necessarily he didn't allude to this particular tension that exists, but it was just like, um, the majority of black scholars in political science come from this institution, University of Maryland and Ohio State. Say whatever you want to about the arrangements, but I did not come from any of those institutions, so I was always like, who are these people that just keep coming out competing for all these different jobs? It was just like, it was just like, it was just like a wave. But I was, in, I, was in, I was in world, I was in conflict, so there was not that much overlap. But you just saw all these people coming out of this institution. So there was a, there was a small amount of like, Tension, hostility, competition, and then you're just kind of like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm like over it. Darren was more an American, so that tension was there. But so to come to this place, to come to, to, come to my nemesis, um, and to be embraced was, was, uh, was phenomenal to have that. And so um, Haynes was, uh, and is, I think, in many respects, just the, the embodiment of everything that you want a scholar, especially a, a senior scholar, to be like to junior scholars. Um, he was producing knowledge, he was producing community, he was helping you kind of like navigate all these things and had this historical um, understanding of the discipline in a way that just it was just lost. Uh, and I wish, I wish we had recorded it, I wish we had done a debrief with him. We, I, I think that lunch became a debrief where he just kind of like, he's like, yo, let me tell you what's up. And it was, I'm still, I'm still referring to that conversation now. But, um, so, it's one of those things where it's like, I hope Haynes liked what I was, what I'm doing in his honor, um, and I, I think I think he might. Um, in many respects, um, 
my talk begins with uh, an observation that reckonings of all different sorts are taking place through America. There's, um, and sorry, I don't want to like drop that in before. Um, there, there will be some slightly graphic material in my talk. So just be warned. Um, so th there's reckonings on police violence that are taking place as people are trying to assess what has taken place and also what are the after effects of these types of behavior. There's broader evaluations. This is the Carceral State Project, which is, which is here at U of M, go blue. Um, evaluations of the carceral state that are taking place more broadly conceived, thinking of prisons, thinking of the military, all these things concurrently. There's discussions of black church burnings in the 90s, remember that? It's like, uh, I'm like <laughs> we, we're gonna get incredibly historical with regards to the, the sheer sweep of things that are taking place. Um, there's evaluations of folks as to what took place in response to the sit-ins in Woolworths. And I'm like, uh, for those of us that remember, uh, sorry, I just need to get this back. For those of us that remember, y'all can hear me though, right? For those of us that can remember Woolworths, um, um, some of us weren't, ha weren't, weren't, weren't sad at all when it went under. Because we remember the, the, the storied history that they had had with regards to how they treated folks. Um, and including myself, um, we, I lived on 103rd Central Park West at some point, and I remember some very hostile interactions with some folks in, in a Woolworths when I was living there. So I'm not, I'm not very happy or unhappy when they, when they dissolve later on. But this is a different time period, right? This is a, a period of um, folks trying to get access. Evaluations of the Klan and other types of hate-related institutions such as that. Evaluations of the Tulsa massacre and, and outrages and when, 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 when riots were white, right? Evaluations of lynchings. Anyone been to the memorial? Brian Stevenson? Oh, come on. Um, I, I, will be, I will be cheering on many other people's projects as it's very kind of like Michigan to do, but there's some things going on in different parts of the United States that I think are, are phenomenal. This, this memorial is one of them, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. I had beef with that pro project too, but separate points. Uh, the Jim Crow Museum. Um, I was recently at um, uh, a youthful hockey tournament and there's uh, the Jim Crow Museum is at Ferris State. Um, I, I had not been to this place before. Um, it was a remarkable facility. They're actually moving, um, but they have um, interesting pieces of memorabilia getting you to reflect about the Jim Crow South, um, a particular aspect of it, um, not like Pauli Murray's evaluation of like state laws and segregation and so forth, but something that I think is um, comparable to that particular effort in terms of its um, depth and its impact upon you. And of course, um, slavery, um, not just uh, broadly conceived empirically, but institution by institution is now reflecting upon what happened. So, why important? It's like, I haven't debated putting this slide in. I'm just like, well, of course, uh, we will all know why it's important. But no, this is, this is America 2024. So this is not clear. So we do need to establish it. Um, we need to establish a historical record as we contemplate um, the discussion of what reparations could be about in terms of amount. We need to think about reparations for what? So broader conversations about the abuses, broader conversations about what took place um, and got... <laughs> we talk about repair of communities. We start talking about what type of treatment might be necessary for them as a function of what they have lived through. And so related, I think those types of things would be informed by this issue. And for those grad students, for the scholars looking for something to do, there are so many questions that we could explore. Um, where in one is African-American life been best protected? Did things remarkably improve when folks left the South to go through the Great Migration to the West and the Midwest and to the Northeast, which is an interesting narrative. Anyone read like um, Isabel Workison's book, you'd be like, oh, you know, it was, it was good that black folk left the South, um, but you know, not everybody left. Did things uniformly improve? Question, why did some blacks leave the South, but many stayed during the Great, after the, during the great Migration? Why did the civil rights movement develop, thrive in some locales, but not others? Why did the black liberation movement thrive in some location, but not others? What did Black Lives Matter movement develop and thrive? How well did it do in different locations? 
Why did black political participation develop, thrive in some locales but not others? Where did the black Wall Streets come from? How did they do? Questions abound. And where, have, where and when have movements, parties, and or leaders been most effective at protecting black lives? I wish that topic would be investigated so much that we'd be like, oh, we, we should have a journal on that. We, par we hardly have anything on this particular thing. But um, the list of questions can go on. I'm going to argue we have, we have limited understanding of this, but there's a, there's a way that we can start to chip away at the questions a little bit and set up a framework for evaluating things. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of these problems are. I'm going to offer some solutions. I'm going to talk about my data journey. I think um, it's, a, it's a very Michigan thing to talk about data. It's not, it's not necessarily a very Michigan thing to talk about your data journey, so I'm, I'm going to try to like per perturb it a little bit. <laughs> Um, I also want to then introduce you to what I'm referring to as the anti-black index. And mm, have I gone through many different titles for this thing? And you, you, uh, hopefully you all will help me. I'm very much viewing this in a very Michigan way. It's like the team, the team, the team. This is something that I'm presenting to you, but I'm presenting with you. I will be asking many questions as we proceed. I will be asking for assistance at the end of this thing. I'm like, let's, this is, this is the team. This is the team. I am, I'm merely hosting this particular event. Um, and then I'm going to talk about next steps, new directions for myself, but also for you, hopefully. Um, and it's like, you know, I'm not asking for like, anyone to like, step up and uh, assist me in some of these efforts. I think you actually have already. It's probably sitting on your computer. I'm just going to ask you to send me the stuff that you have not yet delivered to other people so that I can incorporate it into what it is that I'm doing. Old directions problems. OK, so. There's a bunch of different problems that exist within the literature. Part of it is how the topic of legacies and consequences and outcomes and costs are, are developed. The way that the problems are investigated and explored are part of the issue. So normally, there's a single particular form of abuse or violence that people are interested in. There's a single outcome that they're interested in. And then there's some long delay. This varies. Sometimes the delay is five years, sometimes 10 used to be when we looked at these types of like uh, distributed lag models and so forth. Now it's 100, 150, 200 years, 400 years in some cases. Perfectly fine with the distance temporally. You can think about it conceptually in this way. Some abuse, some time passes, and then you're trying to assess the outcome. Now, the problem with this particular approach or rather, the approach is best exemplified by, um, I'm jumping ahead, sorry. Deep Roots gives us a good example of this particular piece as they're trying to ascertain the effect of slavery and then they kind of slide in Jim Crow for several chapters. But it's basically about how slavery impacts current manifestations of Southern politics, voting and public opinion. Great effort, um, interesting, very insightful in many respects, but I'm, I'm gonna argue that they're, they're part of the problem. They're part of the problem because they adopt this standard way of thinking about the problem, which is, OK, we got slavery, long time passes, and, and now we're going to try to show you that, it's, that there's still some leverage. There's still some importance for slavery for understanding current processes and politics and practices. My beef with this is stuff happened after slavery. And, and that's the thing that bothered me, right? The thing is initially pitched is for the slavery, and then there's the Obama vote. Then they go immediately to like, well, after slavery, there's, there's this thing called Jim Crow. And I'm just like, Jim Crow isn't a thing. Jim Crow is many things. And then, of course, something happens after Jim Crow as well, right? And then something happens after that. And then something happens after that. And so much of that book is about trying to get us to forget about these other things that happen. We're going to try to control for them. We're going to try to get rid of them in some way, shape, or form, and still show that there's leverage for slavery, because that's the thing that we're trying to do. But from my perspective, I'm just kind of like, of what are these things an instance? Are they separate abuses, forms of violence, or do they represent what? Brother Chris would refer to as a latent variable. Some underlying concept that lies underneath all of these things. 
And if it is that, then this approach is somewhat problematic. And we need to think about the thing in a different way. And we also need to kind of bring some unification to this particular issue. But, but how should we bring it together? Are these the same phenomena? Is it appropriate to think of them together? When we do pull them together, are things getting better? Are they getting worse? What's the concept that we should use? And this brings me to the second problem. Conceptually, the limitation exists in that we haven't really approached this the right way. So for many of you, racism got you in the room. Psych. I'm not really going to apply that concept. I'm going to actually try to redefine it, because I think it's highly problematic. It's problematic in part because, um, as typically conceived, thoughts and actions against a person because of their ethnic and racial identity. Like, um, that's partly outcome related, and, and that the behavior needs to be related to the effectiveness of this form of domination. And it's also kind of like um, intentionally related. You need to, you're going after this person because of some animus or some connection. And I'm like, um, I don't know what, I was just talking about this in, in the class with Dan Slater. Um, I'm from New York. Um, Amadou Diallo was someone who was tortured by police and literally had a, a broom broken off inside of him. I don't know what the intent of these particular officers were. I, I think that's irrelevant. I think what's relevant is this individual had their personal integrity violated to some incredible amount, and that had impacts on people. The intent was irrelevant. Whether or not the police were trying to uphold some kind of like status order, also, also not relevant. And so this is similar to kind of Sheffer's argument about not quibbling about genocide. It's like, you know, that's very difficult to figure out. He was a, he's a very much interested in atrocity law. He's just like, if large numbers of people are dying, we should intervene and stop it, and then figure out what's going on. We shouldn't be trying to figure out the intent of the perpetrators involved in the activities before we try to do something, because that's very difficult to prove. So similarly, I find racism to be problematic that way. I find genocide to be problematic that way. Prejudice, opinion based on preconnect, uh, that's not helping us get to, get to behaviors. Discrimination, treatment of different categories of people. This gets us back again to intent and outcome. I'm trying not to go there. Un unjust treatment and control gets us to oppression and domination. So um, why is this project taking me a decade or two? These are all separate literatures that are huge and, and trying to read through them and try to figure out exactly what, what's the best umbrella to put police abuse, to put colored only signs, to put all of these, th what's the best basket? What's the best way to conceptually think about these? I'm, I'm gonna argue that it's human rights violations. Now, um, we can think about this in a variety of different ways. I, I like personal integrity violations because it helps you to kind of focus things a little bit. The right to be treated in a humane manner and in such a way that preserves a person's mental and physical wholeness. We all have the right to not be physically or mentally harmed. We also have the right to engage in politics. This takes us to um, the, the thing that's most sacred for those of us in, in, uh, in the human rights area. This takes us to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. There's a bunch of them, right? Um, but not all of them are equally as attentive or relevant, I will actually argue. I think most of the ones that we pay attention to, freedom from discrimination, right to life, liberty, personal security, freedom from slavery, freedom from torture and degrading treatment, freedom from arbitrary arrest and exile, freedom of movement in and out of a country, peaceful association and assembly, right to participate in politics, and freedom from state or personal interference with the above rights. This is where I'm focusing. Now, that said, there's other ones that people do pay attention to, freedom, of inter freedom from inter interference with privacy, family, home, and correspondence, freedom of belief and religion, freedom of opinion and information, right to desirable work and joining trade unions. Now it starts to get a little bit more complex for folks. The right to own property, really, uh, we're, off the, we're off the reservation now. I'm not, doing, I'm not doing this, but these are the things that people have paid attention to. Right to rest and leisure, right to adequate living. I'm not, I'm not touching these. I'm, I'm, there's like, we are in America. So I'm paying attention to the things that are most traditionally highlighted by 
the scholars in this particular field and the things that I think that are, are, are most relevant. Again, I, I, do, I do encourage folks to expand. I think the, the economic and social and cultural rights are extremely important, but they've had it much less development in terms of their measurement and operationalization than these other forms. And so I stay in line with um, my fellows there. Um, I get to this, I get to the United, the United Racisms of America through Norway, interestingly enough. Um, I had a project called The Consequences of Contention, which involved a similar type of effort to understand how a broad swath of political and civil conflict related issues impacted politics and economics broadly conceived. And then while doing that project, Floyd intervenes and then protests kick off and then people start reflecting a little bit more broadly on things and I'm kind of like, I need to go back to that folder that I had, which was called Strange Fruit, Stranger Tree. It was just a folder. I think we all have them where you just like, you just drop stuff in there. And I just kept coming across all these different databases that concerned something directed against black folk and I just put it in this folder. And Floyd got me to open the folder. It got me to look in there again and see, see what I had on, on police, which at the time I didn't have. I, I started that folder in like 1993. Just started dropping people's data as I was going. <laughs> Mine and ICPSR trying to, because people aren't calling it, there's, there is no anti-black human rights violations data set. There's no data portal for that. No one's calling it that. Um, so I'm like, even some of the stuff I'm looking at, they don't even mention black folk. It just happens to be a subset of the category that people were paying attention to that I extracted for this particular reason. And so while doing this consequences of contention project, I'm like, okay, you know what? I think I need to do the consequences of racial violence. Um, initially, um, I knew I wanted to have the broader conception, but I knew violence was the hook, just like I knew racism was the hook. So I called it racial violence because folks were tuned to that, and, but I was going for everything. I wanted, I wanted the separate but equal. I wanted felon disenfranchisement. I wanted, I wanted all of it. But this, this is what got the money. And so I got some other colleagues to assist me with this particular effort on what to do. And my part of it, um, I'm the PI, but we structured it in such a way that um, Dave Armstrong and myself, um, we were most interested on trying to get at this issue of Legacy of what? So we took it upon ourselves to try to figure out exactly how we were going to measure this thing. And then um, Adrian, graduate of our program, political science, um, he was looking at economic after effects. Cyan, um, uh, friend and former grad student from Maryland. It's interesting how you roll with your family, right? Um, Cyan um, was looking at uh, truth and reconciliation efforts. Um, we brought in then uh, a Yara Asi to look at mental health. Um, there's um, anyone familiar with the phrase um, deaths of despair? It's just like talk about something you want to be a, a household word in many respects, a phrase, uh, familiarity with it. But mental health, you know, political scientists study mental health. What, what, what is that? Um, and so that was, a, that, was, that was a stretch in many respects. But I'm like, OK, we need to look at that because that is a, that is a possible um, after effect or legacy that we should pay attention to. But Dave and I set to ourselves this task of, is there a measure of anti-black human rights violations? How do we measure it? And so um, we came at it in a variety of different ways. We wanted to um, explore how the distinct forms fit together, if at all. Uh, the idea of why I like the idea of racism and discrimination, why I like the idea. Um, if you, say, if you say something like racism, that implies that there's some underlying connection between these different things. Oh, that's racist. Oh, that's anti-Semitic. That suggests that there's some there there that you could pull things together. Um, so things that might not necessarily emerge as being related. Um, so there is a huge literature on lynching. There's now an emerging literature on police violence. There is some literature on um, felon disenfranchisement. Once you pry the data from these individuals who don't wish to share it, I have stories about that as well. I, I, I narc on people all the time for their not sharing data, but that's a, that's a separate point. It's Chris Uggins, by the way, not Jeff Manza, just to, just, just to be clear about that. And we wanted to use a technique that was appropriate and established for the thing that we wanted to pull off. 
So we use the latent variable modeling approach to reduce the dimensionality in data and also to get some sense of how the things relate to one another as well as how they vary. Um, there's a technical appendage to this talk that I will allow. Um, I'll put on my website underneath the, the link to this particular talk for those that want to go there, but um, I don't want to do that because um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the data journey. So I come out of grad school in 92 um, and I become a world scholar because Rick Hoferbert made some remark at a faculty outing that was the following. Um, Christian, how's it going in the program? Fine, Rick. He's a comparativist. Fine, Rick. I'm in TA for his class. Rick had just brought in the Klan after the president of Binghamton University said the Klan could not come on campus. So my, my relationship with Rick is already somewhat, uh, somewhat strained. But I thought that experience was actually phenomenal because the Klan's, the Klan's person was an idiot. And, it, 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 and it, was, it was amazing to let them try to articulate why they did what they did, the theory of mud people. All these things were just incredible. I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. Because there's no way you left that talk thinking that this mode of thought was at all reasonable. And so I'm like, I'm a huge fan of bringing these people into your class and let's, let's, let's interact with them. Let's talk with them. Don't want to ban anybody. So I'm going to bring him in. G. Gordon Liddy, too. I'm like, he, he, was, he, was, he, was a lot, he was a lot better than the Klansman. But nevertheless, um, but. Uh, Folks who know G. Gordon Liddy is, then yeah, you'll get that. Other people, yeah, Google. Um, but so I came out, and um, Rick said, you know, uh, how's the program? I said, I said, fine. Um, and then we moved to this um, interesting conversation where um, he's like, so what American city or African country are you going to study? Yeah, I'm like, I, I, I don't think Rick would have done well with any of the sensitivity trainings we have now. <laughs> and so from that moment, upon Rick saying that, I'm just like, I'm going to study the globe. That's how I became a world scholar. Up until that time, I was interested in the Black Panthers and Black power movements and how police responded to them in the Bay. After Rick's comment, I'm like, I'm going to grab the core list of war data and the World Handbook of Political and Social Indicators, and I'm going to study the globe with this stuff. And so um, that's why my first book is on the democratic peace internationally. And my second book is about the Black Panthers, which I actually wrote first. But there's no way I was going to do that first, because that, that wasn't going to happen. But so when I come out in 92, I am just grabbing people's data. I'm like, if you yourself spend all this time in archives and collecting information, and you acknowledge that everybody else that's around you is doing the same thing, and, and you just you hope that it's decent, you also start, when they're available, you start, hey, I'll take your stuff too. I might use that later on. Hey, would you mind if I had that? So I became very communicative about that and grabbed all different types of data on hate groups and citizens and desegregation and origins of the labor movement and, and how the labor movement plays out. Um, protest data from a variety of different people, anti-miscegenation laws, um, racial threat, discrimination laws, black church arsons, which there's three rounds of these evaluations that are done, by the way, um, outrages, lists of them. Um, I start going to bizarre historical associations where they study things like outrages. I'm like, I'm like the, the, the what, was the, um, what was the, what was the Federal Bureau, of, the Federal Bureau of Freedmen? It's like, you know, so post-slavery, some, or, some or, a U.S. organization to try to figure out what's up with the black folk. And, 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 and when, when white folks go after them, what is this called? It's called outrages. And I'm like, who's, who studies outrages? Actually, who's familiar with the phrase outrages? as a phenomenon. OK, it's like, there, that's a thing. People study that. There's lists of it. So I started compiling that as well. Um, and so much, much of the data I have has no kind of like racial or ethnic component to it at all. Um, the subset that does, um, and I'm, I'm adding to it all the time, um, I've used for um, the data today. Um, so some of the stuff concerns all states of the United States. Some of it concerns a few states. Some of it concerns cities. Some of it concerns counties. Some of it concerns states. Um, so we've embedded the cities within counties. We've identified all the county level stuff. The state level stuff is not going to be in what I'm showing you now, but we are now creating a state weight to the thing um, that I'm going to show you. Um, so we don't have state laws in yet of miscegenation, segregation, desegregation, felon disenfranchisement, black church arsons. Some of the county city level stuff is not in there yet. I'm like, is civil war violence related to anti-black human rights violations. 
Is black on black crime a manifestation of that as we talk about the internalization of black? So I'm just like, I'm viewing all these as empirical questions. And so I'm grabbing all these data and, and now we're trying to incorporate this. There's stuff on sundown towns. I was talking with um, some folks and it's just like, um, we lost Jim Lewin a couple years back. Um, he had this nice book on sundown towns with sundown towns, of course, Rob. But I said, like, um, so it's just like, um, basically, don't, don't let the sun go down on you inward. It's like, and that would be like a sign. It's like, damn. So someone's, got, someone's documenting that. Not the most rigorous of efforts. It doesn't always tell you when it was impact, when it was initially started, when it was away or not, but another data point. Um, the green books, there's a green book that was distributed amongst uh, African-Americans about where it's safe to go. I'm viewing that as, a, as like um, an evaluation of black folks as to qualitatively evaluating the degree to which a particular location is or is not hospitable for them. Another data point. So um, those are not digitized. And so we're, we're in the process of doing that. Hate crimes, hate groups, radical right organizations. People have been collecting data on all this stuff. They just haven't brought it together, which is what we're continuing to do. Characteristics of the anti-black index, uh, 2066 counties with at least one data point, 1552 with at least two data points. This is the distribution of counties and how many data points exist for each of them. You don't need to follow this. You do need to follow this, which is, okay, so our average anti-black index over time, fairly stable. There's a huge, drop or improvement prior to the 1950s, and then things get very bad again in the 2000s. Now, um, I said 2010 in the thing that I distributed, that wasn't as clean as I wanted to have it, so we stop at 2000, and that will be puzzling enough for folks. Um, starting at 1850, we see things concentrated as it relates to African Americans, and that's because they're enslaved they're not all over the place and the treatment is more or less uniform, which you start to see shift over time. By 1960, 1860, we see a little bit more of a distribution. Um, left is good, right is bad, by the way. Higher numbers, horrible. Mass killing, horrible. Personal integrity violations, again, remember. Um, and effectively, 1880, we start to see a kind of bimodal distribution emerge where there's a decent amount of folks who are doing a little bit better and some folks that aren't. And so for me, what I find intriguing is how this spread of distribution starts to look across time. Some places are fabulous for African Americans. They're not being subject to a tremendous number of human rights violations, and some places are horrific. And it's the distribution that I think that's useful for pushing back against, against some of the kind of narratives that emerge. So Isabel Wilkerson's book is about the, the great out-migration from the, the South to the, to the wonderful North in many respects. Um, Michelle, and exact, Michelle Alexander's historical piece is kind of like, it's like, well, things are, they haven't improved uniformly. There's still some other things that are going on. This still is this kind of homogenizing narrative. Not to go after historians, this was not her enterprise to identify every, how every county was doing. But if you do that, then we have different ways of thinking about what America looks like. By 1950, some people are doing fairly well. Some people are doing horribly. And you'll notice that the horror the horror is far worse than slavery. Some folks are having some problems with this. It's like, what's worse than slavery? I'm just like, slavery had an objective to keep black people alive. Not, not to be blunt about it, but you're trying to extract labor. You're not trying to kill off the labor. In fact, you're engaging in all types of torture, psychological manipulation, some selective coercion, but you're not killing off everybody because that's your labor force. Once slavery is ended, Jim Crow tries to institutionalize some of these patterns to maintain some of the labor force, but again, but still you're still trying to keep somebody alive. Jim Crow starts to get disassembled. Some of that goes away, and then it's like open season then you have communities that are just whole hog just going off and killing people. And so the variation is explainable in part as a function of, um, as, as Bob Bates would talk about, um, the importance of the individuals towards their particular role within the economy. 
if you have no particular role in the economy, then you're going to be less um, likely to be treated in a humane manner. And by 2000, we see a modal shift that's far worse than any other historical time periods. So we're collecting new data. We're updating this. We're updating this to the present. But that shift, that shift, I would imagine, would be surprising to folks. Because it deviates from our general exception, uh, our general conception of what we think happened in this country and what people are subject to and what you think people will be willing to tolerate. And so from that perspective, I think the, the data is extremely important. So related, Mike, right? There was a mouse, right? Where is my mouse? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, so we also have um, this functionality which allows you, the user, to pick a county, see what the trajectory of the ABI looks like in that particular location for the data that is available for that place. So this gives us, okay, what was wrong with Texas? I forgot what was wrong with Texas. But this gives us um, several thousand of these trajectories, which we can then think about how many patterns are there over time. Now, I say patterns and trajectories to get us away from the Archaea et al. kind of like piece of there's a single form of um, violence or human rights violation that subsequently has some impact. And to get us to think more about what is this trajectory where things initially get in this particular county, when things get initially worse and then they get better, what's the impact of the trajectory on the particular outcomes that we're interested in? So let's get away from this um, uh, lynchings in this spot or slavery in this spot and think about this trajectory and how that trajectory might have an influence on what's going on. Now, what I don't know is how I get back. Will that work? Yes, excellent. Thank you, Mike, I saw you move, but yes, <laughs> we were together. So. Um, so we have several thousand of these um, trajectories, and then we're using some hierarchical clustering and other rhythm to figure out exactly how many of these patterns actually exist. This is our moment of discovery, Dave and myself. We're just like I, I literally had done this, like, oh, let me take a picture of this. This will be this will be important historically. Our data journey, and so we identify those five distinct patterns. One is a rather fast improvement, and then it levels off. One is a slower improvement. One is a very fast decay. One is a slow decay. One is gets really bad, and then it gets much better. And so for the Legacies Project, um, those that are less interested in this aspect of it, they're looking at how these trajectories influence different types of outcomes. Um, for um, myself, I'm interested in trying to figure out exactly how valid the measure is. One way to do that is to, to gauge how similar or different the different categories are from one another. But also we can think about um, some specific cases. Um, so these are the, the first places that I will be going to um, and start gauging what kind of like local histories exist to kind of help us understand exactly whether or not some of these inflections um, make any sense at all. And so this is part of um, my new search, my new research agenda of um, archival work. Um, if you're interested in trying to think more broadly, it's like, okay, so what's America look like from the perspective of the five patterns? Um, this is what it looks like. Um, to ease <laughs> the, the visuals on that, uh, this would be one. It's places where things got better fast, better slow, 
worse fast. Better than worse. Worse than better. So if you're like, why does it look like that? Then, then we're exactly in the same spot. That's exactly what we should be asking. That's exactly what we should be trying to figure out. This is exactly the type of conversation that I think um, would be emerging from this effort. If you're interested in trying to understand what the different regions look like as it relates to the different categories, then this helps us in a sense, right? We're just like, okay, the Northeast and the West were better incremental. They're not evidencing these kind of like worse than better patterns or especially bad. So some of that narrative of going north seems to be helpful, going west, going Midwest. But remember, there is a distribution, right? And the distributions then become very important for us as we're trying to figure out exactly how this complicates this narrative that we have of like, OK, if folks left the, the horrible south uniformly and went to the north, Midwest, and west, and things were better there, which were just kind of like, well, no, because you got to Detroit, things weren't that nice. You got to Boston. I'm like, I, I'm still. I don't know about some of y'all, but how many buses did Boston people flip over and set on fire? I'm like, I can't go back. I'm like, so I, right, I might be part of the problem. I'll admit that, but I can't go back. I'm just like, that's what I see. That's, I'm just like, I don't care if it's not the same people. I'm like, I still have that memory. I'm done. I'm like, I, I, can't, I can't deal with it. So that's right in the middle of the North, right? So there's something about that. Um, homogenizing narrative that needs to be shifted, which I think is the one thing that we can take away strongly from this particular piece. And then we start to get some answers, right? So um, over time, did things get better? Not uniformly. North, Midwest, West, uniformly better? No. South, uniformly worse? Also no. And we always forget this, the great migration, great migration, great migration. Half the folks stayed. Where'd they stay? Were they related to places that had lower human rights violations? Did you leave a place that had worse violations to go to a place that had fewer? All these questions now get opened up by this particular um, research. Uh, if you're interested, if you're just interested in the distributions by region, then this um, becomes a little bit helpful thinking about the places where it gets incredibly bad, the mode throws you off a little bit as it, as it kind of like doesn't necessarily give you that isolated or few instances where things just got horrific, which could just suck up a lot of energy and attention, but it's not necessarily representative of what took place within a particular place. Um, and then do regions make any sense whatsoever given the distributions that we saw across space? Maybe we end up with a new mapping in many respects of what takes place within the country, which is what we're going to speculate about. But um, next steps, um, we're going to find and add in the other data. We're going to explore variations. It's like you know, slavery wasn't one thing. The thing we, the thing I extracted was I had the 1850 census that I got Ancestry.com to give me. No one, else, everyone else had samples. I, I was like, I want the whole thing. Um, they gave it to me only because I was at Notre Dame at the time, and I think the quote was, um, as you're at this, um, um, uh, what was it, um, spiritually appropriate institution, we will share. Because up until that time, you go to Ancestry.com to find out about your people, not necessarily everyone that was in the census. And so they were not used to giving over four million pieces of information. They were used to like one or a few. But I got them to do this because of this. I, I'm like, I'm going to share this. I'm, it's a, oh, of course. Um, of course, I don't know. They, they thought I was going to leave Notre Dame. But that's a separate point. They did not make that a clause. And so um, I had access to it. But slavery was not a thing, right? So um, we're, now, we're now exploring the differences between the cotton and the non-cotton belt. We're also looking at the places that produced more mulattoes than others to think about sexual predation and how, what that informs us about what was going on or not going on within a particular place. Um, I'm interested in um, the interactive map. I, I want installations. Um, I, I, I'd like one in our lobby. I'd like people to be able to walk up, pick a location, press a button, and add in 
family photos or, inf or diaries or information that they have. I'd like this to be as democratic and open a process as possible for people to share information that they have about this inflection point makes no sense because X or Y. I'd like all that to kind of like open up and then basically see that map and have that map inform individuals in terms of curriculum as we're discussing what did or did not take place in this country. Um, and then I'm on this, um, I got a van. It'll be done in March. This university, this is, this is, why, this is, why, I, this is why I will rock the M. <laughs> this university gave me a vehicle to go do this type of stuff. Because I kept running across people who had things that I would identify and you would classify as archival material. They wouldn't necessarily see it that way. That's just, that's just John's diary or that's just a picture from so-and-so. But it's incredibly important information. And of course, they don't want to mail it to you. Of course, they don't want to let you have it. Of course, they don't want you to do anything with it other than scan it, share it with the world, but give it back. And so now the vehicle will be structured. I'll have privileged access to it, but it's available for everybody. You could retrofit the interior as a function of whether or not you need recording or video or whatever to go do your archival work. I'm trying to get some other institutions to basically do something else so that we can have other places other than just the Midwest covered for this type of thing. But I think this is the type of resource that would be incredibly helpful as we're trying to figure out exactly whether or not these trajectories have identified are being um, validly identified or not. Um, the first book I'm working on on this topic is, um, I'm not just trying to use the county level stuff, I'm looking at alternative aggregations, um, taking the city level stuff in particular, also generating a completely new um, indicator based on longitude latitude for about um, 75 years of the, the, the time period that we have. Um, and also kind of look at multiple dimensions. The thing we forced, we forced a single dimension. It's like we forced anti-black human rights violations. Do they all fit together? Do they all load together on one factor? Or could it be two or three? Now we're allowing for those um, for the book. And really, it's about coevolution of trajectories in many respects. I've talked about anti-black human rights violations, but black, the size of the black population, looking at out-migration and looking at black resistance, I think are incredibly important. Um, so for that, I created a database of all black movements from 1790 to 2010, um, from county to county, so I could identify exactly who's moving and where do they go. And then gonna try to relate that. Um, this was an earlier effort where I was looking at um, um, lynching leading up to subsequent out-migration, but now I have the index, and so now that concept will be fundamentally shifted. I'm not just looking at a particular form, but I'm looking at the, um, the anti-black index and gauging exactly how that influences where people go. The second book is on the thing that um, the RCN paid for, which is this issue of consequences and after effects. So we're gonna look at the, um, the after effects of the trajectories on mental health, political participation, and um, um, wealth. I'll stop there. So the new tech in this room is such that you just speak your question and the microphones hear it, okay? So uh, I'll let you control the Q&A. I just want to say before we will go for a little bit here on the Q&A, as long as people are still actively asking questions until you know we can go to 525 or something, there is a reception afterwards out in the atrium, okay? So, all right, Christian, you want to control your questions? Uh, I think I know the answer. Could you tell us who did the painting? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so my mother's an artist, and um, I forget what it, what has been going on, but I think I got stuck or snowbound with her at some point, and um, she started to do some new technique, and I'm like, so what is that? And then she did it, and this was like post-Floyd, and I was still trying to figure out how to process, and so... I did this painting, tried to work on some children's story. It was like a bunch of different things. 
So I'm wondering about the, the kind of trade-offs, the pros and cons of within the anti-black index, uh, variation within versus variation across. Mm -hmm. So what, what you'll be picking up is a lot of this really interesting variation within. So again, better, worse, worse, better, worse, worse. Okay. But that it's hard to have a sense of baseline. So what is, what is, how, how bad is better? Like, like better might still be quite bad, right? And I'm wondering about just contrast between, the, so variation across, so between anti, the anti-black rights violations versus the universe, the more general population within the United States. And so what, what do we, what's in a sense the theoretical motivation for, or is it more of an empirical um, convenience in a sense to do within, within first, variation within, as opposed to across? Because in some ways the across could be the most striking. Right, to sort of show that even when you get better, 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 this is still worse, worse, worse than what the population looks like, right? So I just wonder, is there a way to bring, or are you thinking about bringing the variation across within this somehow, or how do you think about that? I'll give my version of your question, or I'll give my version of the answer that emerges from my interpretation of your question, and then you, you readjust accordingly. Um, so, um, for the data used for the ABI, I parsed off those things that specifically were concerned with African Americans. Um, but I have a host of other data that concerns other groups. So effectively, you could do an ABI for a variety of different groups. Um, so when I took over minorities at risk, this was basically what I was trying to do. I was trying to go to MicroMar, which is basically these evaluations by group. Um, and so one could do a comparison for example, of um, persecution of the, of, the, of the communists and socialists and gauge um, whether or not that overlaps with anti-black mobilization, which we know there were some relationships there. Um, and so I think that would be informed by that broader effort. That said, I find myself kind of like, um, at the time that blacks were leaving the South to go North, there's clearly an anti-labor sentiment that we need to be paying attention to that has implications. And then blacks are used in a variety of different ways in the places that they come into as scabs and, and strike breakers and so forth. And so that's there. That said, and then we got the dissolution of the cotton industry and so forth. And so I think there's some comparative pieces that, that are worthwhile. At the same time, I find myself kind of going um, some of the lynching literature, for example, um, there's white lynchings that actually precede and then African-American lynchings kind of predominate. And so driven by a different phenomenon. So that comparison doesn't really get you that much. And for some reason, Latinos are not really lynched that much. There's a few, but not, not as, in the thousands that you get with blacks and whites. Um, and so some, sometimes the comparisons don't necessarily help you. But part of the objective of the ABI is to kind of identify, we'll say, okay, lynchings stop. But it's not like all oh, white people got nice. It's more like the tactics shifted to something different. And so then we have as an empirical question, did these tactical shifts occur at different rates or the same rate for these different groups, right? So you have Asians coming into the West. Uh, there's a lot of anti-Asian sentiment, a bunch of things that are happening to them. Is that comparable to these other locations? So I see this as part of um, the kind of like broad, broader projects. But this one was kind of like, I don't hear too many reckoning conversations in the kind of like um, the Latin and Asian communities per se, like historical, all the different types. So I think they're at different levels of collection. Um, the United States is horrible with regards to collection on anti-labor activity. I mean, they start really collecting data after the Wagner Act is passed, right? Which is basically when things get boring. It's like, you know, it's like, okay, let's decimate, 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 decimate. Okay, now that it's de-radicalized, let's collect data. And so all this, there's all this data post-1935, and you're just kind of like, um, you just got rid of all the people that said we should share a profit and so forth. And so I think um, in many respects, there's more, there's more, there's more data and more information and more awareness and more discussion about the anti-black activities. So I find myself kind of there, but I can compare to maybe not dietically every other group as well, but I think I can get a general sense of there's a lot of other things that are going on that were horrible in the twenties and thirties, um, in this location, in this part of the country, but I might not be able to get you to exactly, um, 
you, you read those great historical pieces about how like um, the Italians were going against the Jews, how the Jews, like it's like the Lower East Side of New York or kind of like Northeast. There's, there's this rich literature about kind of folks going at one another and states intervening every now and then. Um, very little data and very little follow-up as to kind of how that happens. And so the progression of information that I have for this particular subset of the population lends itself to this type of thing. And I will make these comparisons as I'm able to. But I actually was kind of like, um, I've been very kind of di disgusted, but at the same time um, intrigued by the pin Pinker model. It's like um, big think, broad scope, let me tell you, let me tell you this, this story. Let's not get bogged down with too many of the details, though. And so that's the, part of, that's the part of Pinker that really starts to bother me. It's just like, I have problems with almost everything he did, empirically stealing other people's data and not properly understanding what it is that they did. But I like, I like that, that, I like that conversation. And so I, I'd, love, I'd love to have that conversation in this context. We'll get it started. Do I think I need to do it before I do the book? I don't think so. So I'm just kind of shifting on that a little bit. Yeah. Sure. Um, thank you for this presentation. I'm wondering if the if in your data set with the ABI, you're distinguishing um, data entry points by who is doing the violence. So, like, what are the patterns of better to worse or that typology look like? If we can segregate. Based off of like vigilantism and lynching, or something like police violence that's consistent and orchestrated by the state, and probably those are related. But I'm wondering if there's patterns there that are different or distinct. Great question. I, I view this as the um, this is the team, the team, the team. I think that would be a great dissertation. I think someone should do that. <laughs> I'm not. Um, in part because I'm like, okay, what? There's like uh, 10, 14,000 policing institutions in the United States. And what are the relationship between these distinct units and any other type of economic or political elite? Good luck getting that data. Um, we know that for a long periods of time, the concept of vigilante and official state in the US was just so fluid that it's hard to kind of figure that out. If you look at the details of the lynching um, information, it's just like, OK, so someone's arrested. They're in jail for some constable who subsequently opens the door and lets this mob that is filled with some of their other fellows, take somebody out, lynch them, set them on fire. State complicity. So we have to have a state complicity measure. And I'm just like, OK, good luck trying to do that. So um, I think we could probably do it for maybe certain locations, certain times. But across like 150 years, um, I'm more than willing to share. I'm more than willing to share <laughs> and let other people take on other parts of it. Um, the perpetrator thing, um, so in a separate project, I'm my dial rip project, Folks know I'm all, all about who's the perpetrator, who's the victim. This one, I'm just kind of like, you know, racism's the thing. I'm just like, you know, why are we, why are we splitting up? Why are we splitting up? Oh, oh, that was the company. Oh, that was that was the that was the local police. That was the state police. So in certain respects, I'm kind of like, okay. So if that's the case, then when I open this thing up in terms of dimensionality, maybe that would help us explain. The dimensions, but if they're all to, if they're all viewed as being positively related to the same underlying latent variable, then I'm less I'm less concerned with that. So I think that'll be driven in part by the kind of empirical specifications as to kind of like oh what, what's explaining these different dimensions. Then then I kind of go in that direction. Maybe. Okay. So I'm I'm having trouble with the interpretation of good scale. Because there's two things. One is genuine progress, like things are good for people. The other is they don't have an opportunity to be bad, because many of their things are outcome measures. Mm -hmm. So, and because you have this, these trajectories, you can imagine some of these good swings are really just, there's no opportunity to be bad. And then maybe some of the good swings later are, are progress, with big scare ones. So how, how do you think about that, <clears throat> especially across time? So good is no torture, no shooting the head, no beatings, right. Um, and this is why I'm interested in blackout migration and population size. I'm just like, and this is why, why the sundown, th sundown town thing became so important. We were just like, okay, so at one point you did have some black folk. Here's what the treatment is. So we can condition kind of like the, the variable on like, you, you have to have some black folk there. 
Um, and then we could look at how the treatment um, then takes place. And then if there's no black folk there, then effectively you should drop out of our peers, right? Um, but this becomes interesting for me because I'm just like, the Sundown Town's idea is black folk leave and never come back. So I'm like, this, so there's a part of me just like, okay, this is what things were like when black folk were there. And then that measure should linger because there's no, there's nothing, maybe dissipates with time, but it shouldn't be washed away, right? And this is why there's certain counties where there were black people at a certain time, there's some incident or something that drives them out and they never, ever go back. Um, and he only did it for like two or three states and, and I'm kind of like, I'm like, why doesn't that apply everywhere? Um, and so, but I think it's definitely related to this. And so this is why I got interested. Um, so my trajectories are inevitably gonna be um, trajectories of um, anti-black human rights violations, resistance and blackout migration and see how they're moving together and then lags and leads. I'm just like, okay, so, um, so from the lynching literature, we know that um, there's lynching, black folk leave, and then whites are like, our labor force left. Maybe we should treat the Negroes we have left better. And so, and then lynching is dissolved. And it's just like, it's like, okay, you're like, uh, wow. Um, and then of course, um, things function as, as like, as it related to, um, do you make a move into certain types of industries or do you not? And the treatment of those subsequent black folk. And so I like the iterative element of it as this thing is very dynamic. Um, the white migration thing also becomes interesting for me because I'm just like, okay, if you grew up in a location where you treated your black folk in a particular way, then the black folk leave and you migrate to another location. Are you similarly violating folks in this new spot you went to? So um, in the context of the Black Panthers, uh, Oakland and San Francisco recruit from locations where they had horrible treatment of black folk in the deep south to be their police force. So stuff like that becomes like incredibly difficult to kind of like track, but you get snippets of it, right? So you could probably run some interesting simulations or expectations of who you think these people are as a function of where they're going. But um, we have an element of this project. There's this um, there's this neat kind of generational survey thing that would be fun. That's like here, um, where like um, it's these linked kind of like um, families in public opinion polls across time, so you can kind of get some sense of. What something was like in a particular location, and then see where those folks go, and then what they what they do, and how they're thinking about different things. I think the generational component and movement are incredibly important for understanding that. So I got you there. Yeah, thanks for the talk, Christian. So I was thinking about how you're defining violence. Maybe if you could touch on that a little bit more. Um, my per my perception from your talk is that maybe you were defining violence according to the. Um, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, maybe that would be like the bounds of it. Because I think a lot of times when we're talking about violence and conversations like these, we only speak of physical violence and not necessarily the, the mental aspect of it, not mental vis-a-vis -vis I was physically hurt, now I have mental psychological ramifications because of that, but just simply violence in terms of existing in a space where a Supreme Court justice, for example, can say there are no rights in this country that Black men have no rights in which a white person is bound to respect in this country. So, and even going off what you were just saying about sundown towns, does a sundown town have to be active or to be violent? Because just by proxy of how Michigan being down the street, that feels violent to me. And then what if I have to drive through there and it's dark? And so violence in terms of physical violence, like lynching, torture, and things like that, but also just violence of just existing, if that makes sense. It does. I don't do that. I'm a very big, you know, a Susan Sontag person. Um, I, there's many influences I take from a variety of different things. The complexities on trying to gauge that, I'm like, it's hard enough. It's hard enough tracking dead bodies, let alone how someone felt about a sign. So um, I'm much more conventional in the sense of a personal integrity violation is you have this entity, and this is, I will, I will lose some folks on this already. Someone has a body, they're embodied in this body. If I, if I penetrate or harm the functioning of that body in any way, shape, or form, then that counts for me. So you're bound to just, within this context, you're bound to the physical. Yeah. Leave complete space for folks to jump in with other perspective, perspectives on it, but especially going back in time. I'm just about to, up with, I 
think a way around it, but I think there's also a limitation with it. So I was very happy, like many people, when we start to find out that all this material had been digitized, all these like books, have been, like millions of books had been digitized, and like Google holds all of them, and I think we had some access to some of them, but not all of them. But I was kind of like, oh, that would be great, because then we could code all those information, all those books, and all those journals, and all those other things, and get people's perspectives on things like that. Of course, whether or not they're telling us the truth, something completely different, or they're just performing, whatever. But that's some source of information that we could then use. Or I thought the N-word searches in like Google searches became useful to think about kind of like um, what that told us about a place. So there's some things like that that you can use. Um, but doing the class with um, Dan, I'm reminded of like Goffman and all this other stuff. And I'm just like, the minute you start to say something and it's an audience, I don't know that I could trust you. And then especially as a black person, Dunbar is always in my head. It's just like, we wear the mask that grins and lies. And I'm just like, mm, OK, so I can't trust any utterances. Also back to the New York thing, right? So I'm just like, if you accept that, and that's your kind of like philosophical orientation, then what information could I take in that I would accept is an expression of your actual sense of fear or dread or trauma concerning a particular thing. And actually, if we are traumatized, how can we express ourselves appropriately, right? This is, this, this is my beef with a lot of the, the survey work that follows kind of like uh, violent activity. If like a whole village was decimated and you came out of that village or you're next to that village, I'm gonna ask you questions and how are you gonna be able to articulate what you think happened or why you think it happened? And so that's, uh, that, is a, that is a much harder, thing to do. And, and it's, it's already hard. My friend Patrick Ball, the human rights data analysis group, makes the comment. Because I'm just like, yo, man, why you just pay attention to dead bodies? He's just like, because you could only die once. You could be traumatized n number of times. And that becomes a completely different enterprise to try to figure out how to validate. So I'm, I'm with you, but you can handle that one. I, I, I'm, I'm already struggling with what I got for decades. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but so piggybacking on this, so what about the slow death aspect, right, of not getting the right access to food, to mm -hmm. health care? I understand why you take the bodily integrity, but how do you think about the slow death? That's one question. My second one is I really like your legacy, the way you critique the literature. I'm going to, my words, not you, but the literature on the long-term effects of. And I'm making two critiques, and I would like you to talk a bit more about this. One is, and to me, the visual, so thank you for that, because I hadn't thought of that. So you have a treatment slavery, but what you show is that from that moment, the kind of repertoire of violence expands so much, and you're just not capturing this if you're just looking at this. But there's another, and so you're just, you're literally missing the treatment, like the nature of the treatment. But the other one that you could, it's less of a critique, and it's more, let me help you out. You've got this reduced form effect, that let's say we believe the econometrics is there. There is some quote unquote effect. There's a random variation in exposure to slavery that I can identify as causally related to whatever outcome. And what you're doing is more saying, you guys are stuck thinking about the mechanism as a way to think what's happening between the two that thinks about varieties of trajectories. And then you're less critical, you're more helping them for the next step of the research. Would you say you're doing both or mostly the former? I think I'm helping to the extent to which um, I think the best answer to that question will be the trajectory, the overlapping trajectory. I think that the blackout migration and the resistance and the adaptation of the superordinates to try to figure out how to kind of subjugate amidst the moving population resisting, um, I think the co-evolution of those will provide the best answers for kind of like what the lingering effect will be for these different kind of instantiations of uh, different types of activities of emerging. Um, your first question, though, the slow death thing is harder, right? Um, I mean, I'm a huge Galton fan, but I'm like, good luck measuring it. I'm like, I'm like I, I love him, but damn, hard to get at. Um, but I think there's something to be said, and this is, um, um, and we have, it, we have kind of like uh, debates, Dave and myself, um, I'm of the opinion that if all the state laws are pointing in a particular direction that are excessively um, supportive of segregation, then the same exact score should be very different in that environment than one place where they're trying to integrate 
to a large degree or uplift in many respects. And so I think contextualization matters from trying to get that. But I think there's something to be said about being able to kind of like bring to bear these other contextual factors to think about um, how that might influence someone's capacity to kind of like uh, generate a livelihood in some way, shape, or form. So Lisa Cook has got this great piece. It's again in this general tradition where she's got like lynching and like patents. It's like, does, does lynching influence African American patents? I'm like, okay, that's related to kind of like um, your ability to kind of like uh, engage in certain type of intellectual activity and have a life and all these other type of things. And so I think there's ways to kind of like spin this off um, or access to water, or we could link this to, um, do I think the ABI will be higher in locations where black folks happen to be forced to live next to trash dumps? I think there's a bunch of, um, I'm very sensitive to the kind of like slow genocide arguments but again, the operationalizations for the economic, social, cultural rights are just so far behind the rest that I think that's a little bit harder to pull off. But I think the deaths of despair bit is trying to, is pushing me in that direction because I'm just like, black suicide, black depression. I'm like, you know, I like Durkheim as much as the next person, but I'm just like, okay, so does it make sense that you'd be depressed? I mean, Elon Meyer, um, and does, anyone, um, does anyone know Elon Meyer's work? Um, my problem, my beef with this particular field is like their their thing is blackness leads to deaths of despair and all these other negative health benefits. And I'm just like, so Oprah and my cousin Freddie, who just got out of jail, are who are both black. That's comparable. I'm like, so I was just like, you need to get at what happened. What's the behavior? Um, and so I think some of these simplifications would be perturbed by what we're trying to what I'm trying to do here. Um, and then you, you push us in a, a yet another di different direction, which I think is kind of like, okay, you know, well, just paying attention to the dead bodies and in itself limiting. And I'm just like, I'm with you. I, I agree with that. Um, and then trying to go to wealth and trying to go to um, educational environments and just trauma writ large. I'm like, I think trauma gets us very far with um, trying to figure out the kind of slow death bit because if you're traumatized, what follows from that with regard to your capacity to do anything? And so I think um, the language might not be there, the, the, the slow genocide, um, the slow ABI, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, we're struggling with the language with, with describing most of these things, right? Um, but thinking of long-term after effects, was it in of itself a big innovation for the research community to try to figure out how are people impacted by this thing? The, the discussion around Tulsa, I find to be fascinating, but, what happened next? What happened before? It's these isolated chunks of discussion. It's like, okay, did Tulsa thrive up until that point? Was everything fine? It's like, no, there's like interesting inequality within the black community in Tulsa, which folks don't want to talk about. And the middle class folks are the ones who are basically still get interviewed because everyone else got decimated before that. And so these interclass kind of like dynamics get, um, get captured and eliminated, but I'm kind of like, I'm viewing this more as like, this is the opening point for all these types of conversations, which I'm not really seeing a space for doing it as we're having these very narrow conversations about slavery or lynching or outrages or single outcome variables. And I'm just like, I'm like, no, no, no. It's, it's all, it's all open now. Let's, let's pool all the data. Let's figure out exactly how these things do or do not relate to one another. And then let's point it at every single freaking outcome variable you could possibly find. Now, that's not going to get you published in a, in a journal because they're not set up for that. But I'm like, forget that. This is a book series. This is a film series. This is a graphic novel series. We need to, we need to move beyond these other conceptions, right? And so um, I definitely accept the Paterra's change. Um, this kind of follows up uh, something behind you. Right next to you, man. Shay. <laughs> um, so it's fascinating for me to see this, this diffusion of violence over time, which confirms intuitions I've had studying police violence about how this is diffusing with more and more people over time. But can you say say more about, for in the 80s and 90s, like aside from police killings, what other forms of violence are you looking at in your measures? Um, so we have, the, we have the disenfranchisement bit, you know, your ability to participate in politics. Um, there's the, the growth of um, the radical right 
bunch of there's a there's a wide variety to the to the radical right. Only some of them are focused on black folk, and some of them are focused on a bunch of other things. Um, and so we're capturing the kind of growth of the right. We're capturing um, if someone talks to you about hate crimes, it's like eighty percent of the hate crimes are anti-black stuff. So it's just like um, so it's 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 that it's police stuff. It's um, civil society. Um, it's voting. Um, so all those things kind of concatenate to kind of give you give you those elements. But the, but you are you are right. They are the, the the tactical the tactical repertoire of anti-black activity. Um, the composition of it does shift over time, in part as a function of like you know economic necessity. It's like okay, we don't need this we don't need this form anymore because the economy or the basis of the economy is fundamentally shifted. So now we have this other thing that we need to do or can do because now more black people are concentrated in this place as opposed to this place. So I think um, that then becomes another question that we then kind of open up right as we're thinking of the anti-black repertoire and what influences that or what can influence that because even if we get Please to act in a particular way, imaginary world. Um, okay, what about all these other perpetrators? Are they going to be similarly perturbed by these same types of influences? And that then raises some interesting questions because then we need to know the range of perpetrators. We need to know the range of different activities so we have some better understanding of intervention points. Because right now, many of our intervention points and many of the discussions we were having and many of the funding coming out of Arnold and a bunch of other places are just like, the police are the problem. I mean, the broader conversation of the carceral state is like is like a nice intervention, right? But that became the domestic carceral state. We're not dealing with the international carceral state, which is then a whole other thing because we then get rid of the U.S. military bases, we get rid of the U.S. military training abroad. I mean, we, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we would be having conversations about, which have been parsed because we we now zero in yet again on a particular perpetrator and a particular form of uh, human rights violation. Mark. I was going to ask you to say a little bit more about measurement, in particular with respect to the uh, underlying dimension, the latent variable. Uh, so there is a lot of different episodes and events that, that you put in, and there's something underlying them. Uh, I assume that uh, there's more than one underlying variable, that uh, this combination does yield more than just one. Not yet. Not yet? No, didn't allow for it. Forced it. Okay, that's, uh, now, interestingly for us, um, all the factors that we investigate are all positive with the way for this particular one. So if some were negative and some were positive, that would then kind of lead us to believe that there'd be multiple dimensions, but we haven't opened that up yet. Yeah, I would expect the directions to align, but that there would be more than one subset and more than one conceptual entity. Uh, but it's quite interesting that's not, and I don't need to ask the rest of the question. I'll let you know when that comes. Mary. Um, I had a question about the way in which you seem to give uh, more weight or privilege to, to region, uh, at least in how you presented the data. And I'm wondering about uh, something like deindustrialization, where it doesn't happen, like deindustrialization happens in different parts of the country at different times. And how do you think about trying to capture that sort of variance between regions if you're looking at it in a sort of, it seemed to me like sort of a linear way over you know the course of whatever, 100 or so years? So I'm definitely, I'm definitely not tied to region. I am tied to trying to have a conversation with people who are tied to region. I'm trying to obliterate regions. I'm like, these make no sense given the nature or the relationships of people moving between different locations and industries doing what they will in different locations and all these things. So basically, you try to step away from it. But if you consider kind of like where folks are, like, oh, great migration. OK, from this location to these locations, the narrative there. Or OK, well, you had the new Jim Crow with this manifestation in this location for, as opposed to this one. I'm just kind of like, no. The variation is the thing that we should be trying to understand. And then, and then look at, um, we have, um, I couldn't find this particular figure, but we created a figure which is like, what would the United States look like as a function of um, kind of um, um, con contiguity of like-minded, kind of like, or, or like experienced geographic locales, like how many different geographic locales emerged from that. And I think we had like 12 or 13. And so you know, to try to get us away from this discussion of 
Midwest. I mean, like, we're, I still don't understand Midwest, right? It's just like, it's a historical thing. I'm like, we're in the damn middle. <laughs> but, you know, but we don't aggregate certain directions. We don't go too far. I'm like, where's, is it, isn't the South in the middle? I'm like, so it's like, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's confusing. Um, and so we are trying to rethink um, region as a function of these experiences. But um, I think deindustrialization is, is a huge factor for, uh, back to kind of like earlier conversations about thinking about alternative forms of things that are going on in the country that have implications for how black folk might be treated. Um, and so a rethinking of region, I think, also kind of emerges from this. Okay. No. Oh, sorry. All right, everyone. This was great. Thank you, Christian. Thank you.